Welcome to Guilford at 250. This is part of a series by Preservation Greensboro to celebrate the fact that Guilford County is now 250 years old uh, and to celebrate the diverse history that we have in this county uh, that is unique to our little uh, part of North Carolina. Um, Guilford County was established in 1771. It has a rich heritage of architecture and culture. And part of that uh, discussion includes the Reconstruction Era. The Reconstruction Era has arguably been overlooked in the past, but we're now beginning to understand as historians that this is arguably one of the most important periods of American history. Um, at the close of the Civil War, there was a reinvention of the United States and a reinvention of the American South, especially here in Guilford County. We saw uh, a diversity of people, both um, uh, native African-American populations who banded together with Republicans, some of whom were of the Quaker faith and abolitionists of, of Guilford County, and people with a legal background uh, who came from the North, uh, also known as Yankee carpetbaggers. And these groups allied with each other, uh, were very involved in the recreation of Guilford County. And for a brief period of time in the 1868 election, uh, we came much closer to historical equity and, and uh, social equity than we had come for a very long time. Um, and that is a chapter of history that we're going to talk about today with our special guest, James Shields. Um, James is well known here in Guilford County. He uh, serves as the director for the Bonner Center for Community Service and Learning at Guilford College from 2001 to 2020. Uh, there he earned a degree in history and African-American studies. And during his tenure at the Bonner Center, James encouraged and developed a broad range of visual and perform performing art initiatives that aim to raise critical consciousness, build community, and motivated students to promote civic engagement and social change. For over 20 years, he has given numerous dramatic presentations on the Underground Railroad to local schools and civic groups. James has served uh, as one of the lead guides for the Underground Railroad tours at Guilford College on their campus. He's also well known for his work as an actor and director uh, in the drama produced by uh, Snow Camp Outdoor Theaters, uh, Pathway to Freedom, which depicts uh, the local history of the Underground Railroad in our neighboring Alamance County. James has over 40 years of experience in the performing arts, and he's currently planning performances in 2021 uh, for his one-man show about Frederick Douglass. So there's no one better in Guilford County to talk about this amazing and interesting period in our history than uh, James Shields. So James, thank you so much for joining us today, and I really look forward to your presentation. All right, well, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, you're right, the, the Reconstruction period is certainly considered uh, probably one of the most pivotal eras in our history. Um, it was supposed to kind of make real the promises of the 14th Amendment, 15th Amendment, uh, where we got birthright citizenship, equal protection, due process, the right to vote, and the protections of that right. And, um, you know, formerly enslaved Africans were, um, were looking for those rights and privileges. Um, you had people like Frederick Douglass and others who really pressed for that. Um, Henry Louis Gates describes the era as 12 years of maximum freedom, followed by an all black, all white rollback. Um, and he would tell you, uh, we, we, we were in the middle of seeing that again, right? Um, but just this idea of 12 years of maximum freedom, the freedom to worship, the freedom to work, the freedom to um, build wealth, the freedom to vote and to be part of the political process only to have that snatched away. Um, and so a lot of the focus that we wanna talk about today, of course, we wanna look at a lot of the buildings, some of the institutions uh, that were in Guilford County. Um, one thing I wanted to do and I'm going to switch over for you here. So making our place, the idea of um, 
that by the end of Reconstruction, I think black black communities realize, and this is all over, that that black communities realize that they would need to, uh, as they say, make a way out of no way. Um, they no longer had the protections of federal troops. Um, they no longer had the assumed um, protections and um, promises of being able to vote and things things of that nature. Uh, you know, black black men were being snatched off the, the streets if they if they um, if they were found vagrant and put into work camps and things like that. So this is a very crucial time for the black community and especially in Guilford County. And we, we wanna lift up a few of the institutions that we think really rose to the occasion and really became the foundation of what would later become, uh, you know, activists, educators, uh, other professional people, uh, leaders in our um, community here in Greensboro and in Guilford County. One thing I wanted to do before we get too far, I wanted to mention some of the early free Blacks that lived in the area. And this is before the time of, um, before emancipation. Um, by about 1840, um, there were over 600 free Blacks that lived in the area. Um, a lot of them, of course, here's, uh, here's New Garden and where Guilford College is and New Garden Friends Meeting. And then if you go up Horsepin Creek, up here around Reedy Fork, uh, we know that there were, there were um, little enclaves of um, black folks that lived there. Some of them were considered what they called Quaker free Negroes. These were people who technically were owned by Quakers, but they were free to, to, to do as they wish. But most of the people were legally free. And um, we also know that a lot of them left the South as uh, things got, as we go into the 1840s, things got pretty, pretty rough for Quakers who were involved in uh, the Underground Railroad. And it just wasn't, if you were free and black living in the South, especially in North Carolina, uh, it wasn't very safe. So I just thought it was important to point these guys out and understand that, you know, even before that time that we had families of free Black people who, of course, would then join with those, those emancipated Black people. Um, so as we go into um, the time of emancipation, going into the time of Reconstruction, uh, I think there's three things that we need to consider, three things that become the bedrock for the resilience of Black folks in Guilford County and in this country. Uh, one had to do with school and education, the church, and then uh, enterprise. When we, when we talk about enterprise, I think it's really, it's always been important to me, even when we speak about enslaved Africans, it's been very important for me to talk about the, the, the fact that um, they came with skills. A lot of the houses, a lot of the roads, a lot of the farms, they were done by us. A lot of the innovation in technology, especially farming technology came from the people that were actually doing the work. Um, and so it's just very important for me to uh, make sure that people understood that. And it is important, as you'll see, uh, many of the buildings that were built by these institutions were built by African-Americans, were built by Black people. And so uh, I think it's really important for us to understand that. So after emancipation, we know that one of the top priorities for freed slave for the for the freed slaves and we're talking approximately nine million people nationwide was education however most states at this time uh, were reluctant to provide a lot of public schooling eventually though it was segregated North Carolina would eventually become a leader actually in public ed education for African Americans 
But immediately after emancipation, um, we had to rely on um, different white denominations. We had to rely on our own, um, whether it was donating land, donating money, or time. Um, Frederick Douglass tells us that to found an educational institution for any people is worthy of note, but to found a school in which to instruct, improve, and develop all that is noblest and best in the souls of a deeply wronged and long neglected people is especially noteworthy. Uh, I think that's a great quote. I think it really says a lot about us as a people in that education was always the key. Education was always that carrot. Um, Frederick Douglass also says, and you know, I quote him a lot, um, that um, that education makes a man unfit to be a slave. And so now that you have these nine million people who are no longer enslaved, they understood that education was crucial. That was that void that they were denied. So. Let's start looking at some of the educational institutions. And let's start with, let me go back here. Clear that up. Let's start with uh, North Carolina a and a very famous college that was created back in 1891. And um, According to the uh, according to their website and their mission, the college was established with the intention to teach practical agricultural and mechanic arts and such branches of learning as relate thereto, not excluding academic and classical instruction to African American citizens of North Carolina. This was a very uh, important institution, especially in this part of the state. Um, when um, A&T started, once again, you had a lot of rural folks who were either sharecropping or uh, just really trying to figure out how do we how do we get this next level of education? How is it going to be um, available to us? And um, North Carolina A&T was that place. Now, right now we're showing you the uh, James B. Dudley building and it's named for the second president of the school. And um, this, this one opened, this particular building opened in uh, 1931, but it, the original Dudley building was actually constructed in 1893, but it was destroyed by fire, which we're finding out happened a lot to um, a lot of buildings dur during this time. Um, and I guess if you're heating with fire, you're you're um, taking a lot of risk. But the um, Dudley Building is currently used uh, as an administrative building. is currently used as a as a uh, museum and an art gallery. Um, as you'll notice, you will see the uh, six columns on the front. Um, and this particular building was um, designed by Greensboro architect Charles, Charles Hartman. And like a lot of the buildings that we see, especially the educational buildings, um, certainly had a classical style. Um, during this time, you had what they call the colonial revival. And so you had that going on. And, and many of the other colleges also had um, what what they call the Georgian style to to their buildings, and um, A and T certainly was not um, was certainly part of that as well. I guess yet another a closer uh, look at the Dudley Building, and of course the uh, Greensboro Four, and we'll and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the folks there. Um, now I'm going to move pr pretty quickly. Um, we're going to move on to um, Bennett College, and this is Pfeiffer Chapel at um, Bennett College. Uh, Bennett College had its beginnings uh, in the basement of a church, uh, Warnersville uh, Methodist Episcopal Church, 
and is now known as St. Matthew's. And, <clears throat> and you had about 70 men and women who first came. And then um, around, let's see, they started around 1873. And then it was changed to an all women's college. But um, as you can see, once again, the very classical style of the buildings. Um, this is a beautiful chapel with the with the spire going up and everything. Here's another shot of Pfeiffer Chapel. Um, I think the alumni house, which I don't have a picture of, but the alumni house on the campus is the oldest building that's on that campus. Let's move on to um, Palmer Institute. So Palmer uh, Institute is located between here and Burlington. It, it, it was founded in 1902 uh, by Charlotte Hawkins Brown, and you see her here. And then you see a group of um, students who um, are graduating. Um, she named it Palmer after her mentor, Alice Freeman Palmer. And the school, um, it really started in an in a old um, blacksmith shed. And eventually um, it was started providing education for rural youth. And by the end, it really became this finishing school. And a lot of um, pretty well-to-do people in the, the African-American community came to Palmer Institute. Um, I know my, my mother would talk about I, I grew up in Durham and my mother would talk about how there were um, certain of her friends, they, they didn't go to high school with my mom, they went to Palmer Institute. Um, this building or, or this um, spot had as, as much as 300 acres at some point and over 14 buildings. Some of them uh, burned, but some are still available. And I know that they are trying to refurbish. They're raising money to, to, to refurbish uh, many of the buildings. As you see here, this is Stone, Stone Hall at Palmer Institute, uh, the Cary Stone Cottage. Uh, I've been in there, it's a beautiful, beautiful spot. Uh, most of these buildings were built by people in the community, built by, um, possibly students as well. The uh, William Penn School, I think it's a pretty interesting um, story. Uh, this is in High Point and the William Penn School was opened in uh, 1868. So right after the emancipation. And um, this was done by the aid of the Freedmen's um, Bureau. So this was an example of what the Freedmen's Bureau could do on the positive end, had it been allowed to um, be around for longer than what the 10 to 12 years that it was in existence. Um, schools, um, financial institutions, things like that. These were some of the things that the Freedmen's um, Bureau um, helped to create in many communities. So, this is one of the city's um, High Point's first high schools for Blacks um, with the backing of the New York Society of Friends or Quakers. And um, it used to be in Asheboro and then it relocated to High Point. And it later became known as the William Penn High School to honor its um, Quaker founders, similar to the uh, Penn School at uh, St. Helena Island in South Carolina, which is a spot that I have visited a lot. And uh, it, was a, um, it was a school that certainly worked with um, students in terms of in industrial skills, agricultural skills, but also the, the basics, the reading, the writing, the arithmetic, um, the vocational training that they knew that these folks needed in order to make a living. It was really crucial for them to be able to, to have this opportunity. Uh, let's see. This is J.C. Price School. And 
I'm going to transition a little bit from some of the, the actual schools. Uh, but this is um, the, the JP, JC Price School that was that is in Warnersville. Uh, we're going to look at some of the, going to talk a little bit about some of the communities. So Warnersville is considered Greensboro's first suburb. And it was developed near Ash Street um, right after the Civil War. And um, it was named for uh, Yardley Warner. And um, he purchased um, about 35 to 40 acres on the just south of the limits of Greensboro. So Warnersville, as of course you know now, is in the middle of Greensboro. But back then it was a suburb, it was on the edge. And so um, you had people like um, Harmon Unthink, who was a, a formerly enslaved African. He was one of the first landowners. He was the official um, or the unofficial mayor uh, back in the 1870s. And you know, he started a business, he had a repair shop, but he also became involved in local and state politics, um, which was possible until the end of reconstruction. Uh, and this was true all over the South where um, newly freed black men felt emboldened, felt really a responsibility to be involved, to represent their community in political matters, in civic matters. So um, Warnersville also Coming out of Warnersville, several of the um, oldest congregations came out of Warnersville. St. Matthew's, New Zion, um, and and uh, several schools like like the Ash the Ash Street School, and of course the J. C. Price School that we're looking at here. Unfortunately, Warnersville, like a lot of places, um, many of the old homes that we know from Warnersville were um, cleared for urban renewal programs. Uh, once again, as I mentioned, I, I grew up in Durham and my grandfather would take me around Durham and he would show me all of, all these places that used to be um, Haiti. And it was part of the so-called urban renewal program of the 60s. Um, so unfortunately, a lot of the old homes are not there, but a lot of the people, a lot of the families that are still there and, and they are certainly trying to uh, keep up the history. This is um, East White Oak. And East White Oak was part of the uh, White Oak uh, textile mill, which was open in 1905 by Moses and Caesar Cone. Um, and they produced um, fabric and denim, uh, I guess till about 2017 when they closed the, um, the mill. This center was initially built as a elementary school for the children of the black cone mill workers. Um, so the cones had several mill communities. And this particular one was, was for the, the black mill workers. Uh, the White Oak Center started out simply as a, as a one room school. And e eventually it became the center of the community. Uh, it had a convenience store, it had a beauty salon, um, um, recreation programs, church programs, and they had all types of things there. <laughs> Um, around the 1950s, the city who had possession of the property wanted to demolish this center and the late Truman Gant stepped up and he rallied the community of East White Oak. They were able to save the property and the property once again became the center of the community. And out of that community, we had people like uh, David Richman, who was of course part of the Greensboro Four, who um, grew up in that neighborhood. And we know that uh, there's a subdivision 
It's very, very close to the White Oak community that's named after Truman Gant. Um, I've, I've looked at several of the videos that, um, that we have online about cone mills in general. Um, it seems like it was too, too good to be true, right? In terms of the, um, the company stores and things like that. But uh, once again, even with all that, the fact that they felt that it was necessary to segregate and have a separate black community, I think it's interesting and just tells us a lot about that time. And so this is the um, East White Oak Center. And again, this this classical style that that you see with the columns and whatnot. Um, I think this is something that is prevalent in most of the architecture that we see. So moving forward to the East Market Street area, again, another area that was deconstructed um, during the time of urban development. Um, from about the turn of the century till about the late 50s, um, this was the shopping and the social center for many African Americans in Greensboro. And as you see, we're not just talking about a bunch of shacks or anything. We're we're we're, we're talking about very well-made brick uh, buildings. Uh, as you see, a lot of folks um, there there in front of the Palace Theater. Um, and there were clubs, there were stores, there were all types of things that were there. Very, very self-sustaining. Uh, it was really fascinating for me to read more about East Market because as I mentioned, I grew up in Durham, Black Wall Street, Haytai, and I thought, well, we were the only ones, right? But yet there were Black Wall Streets as we know all over the place, uh, not just in Durham, but in Greensboro and Winston and Tulsa, Oklahoma, and other places. Um, it really shows, I think, the, the ingenuity of Black people. It showed how back then um, this idea of, well, I guess back then they really didn't have a choice in most cases in terms of keeping their dollars in their community and to support the businesses that were there, whether it's a restaurant, whether it's a bar, a club, um, a funeral director, any of these places. Um, but this is um, East Market Street. It's another picture, uh, East Market, the Vines building. Um, this was a, a spot where um, they helped out. And, I'm, and, I, and I've read this story in so many times in different cities where black soldiers didn't have a place to go, couldn't go to the um, USO for, for, for white soldiers. And it was up to local citizens to step up and to provide a place for soldiers to go. And the, the Vines building, the upstairs of the Vines building was one of those places. Here's a picture of um, people from the terracotta community. The, the um, ter terracotta community is, was, well, I guess it still is. There's a there's one square block of the community that is still there. Um, it was built, it was a, it was basically a little company community. Um, for the Pomona Terracotta Manufacturing Company. And a lot of the people that you see here are related either by blood or by marriage. Uh, a lot of them came first from South Carolina, then to Chatham County. And then when the P Pomona plant was created, a lot of them immigrated here to Greensboro. So the um, Terracotta plant was created in uh, 1886 by um, Jay Lindley and John Logan and William C. Barron. If you know anything about 
building materials, then that that boring name certainly uh, should stick out for you in terms of boring brick. Um, they would create bricks. They would create um, agri agricultural drain tiles. And I've seen these kind of terracotta tiles um, at Guilford College. And I can only assume uh, that they were probably manufactured at this plant. So many, like I said, many of these people came from Chatham County and there is a small museum in one of the houses there. And um, though a lot of people don't live there anymore, uh, a lot of people come back. They, they have, they used to have what they call a ter terracotta days and people would come back from wherever they are to reminisce and share the history of, of that community. And this is the terracotta community. Just down the road also in, um, in that kind of West Market area is a, was, a, was a place called Woodyside. Woodyside <clears throat> was uh, created in the late 1800s by Quakers, um, John and Mary Woody. And they made plots available for African-Americans so they could build homes, which is um, reminiscent to what was done um, pre-emancipation and some of the folks that lived um, up in that Horsepin Creek area. So um, not only did they, did they have plots to build homes, but African Americans also had they they had a Rosenwald school, uh, which was um, Julius Rosenwald built, you know, over five thousand schools for young black kids, um, really all all in the rural South. And so this is in the uh, West Market area as well. Again, a lot of those um, areas, like um, ter Terracotta, for example, is now surrounded by industry, by, um, you know, car lots and things like that. Uh, the Woody side area, I think, from what I think is the Woody side area, I think it's a bunch of apartments now. Um, and then a lot of that area, which is now West Market, some of that is 40. A lot of uh, African communities were displaced there. So once again, you see a pattern of these established black communities, some of them going back to the days of reconstruction, but for the sake of progress have been um, deconstructed. I wanted to also mention, as we think about terracotta, I also wanted to mention um, Persimmon Grove. Persimmon Grove also, uh, which is a church, um, Persimmon Grove AME Church and the surrounding community started out, they, they were created back in 1882. They had a log building on what they called the old Winston-Salem Road, which is now West Market Street. Again, um, this was a place where they had to move. They're now on Dolly Madison Road, but the cemetery for um, Persimmon Grove is still right off of West Market. It's not easy to find because you can't really get to it right off of, of, of West Market, but it is there. Um, I think if you go to find a grave or, or, or uh, find, there's, there's a site called Find a Cemetery and you can actually find that. And um, I went there not too long ago and it was interesting to see some of the old um, grave markers, some of them were hand carved, um, very, very crude uh, writing. Um, I love spending time in old uh, cemeteries like that. So uh, to, to see those engraved markers for me was pretty incredible uh, to see. Um, per Persimmon Grove had a long and close relationship 
with the Quakers and with uh, Guilford College in particular. In fact, um, New Garden Friends School started at the Persimmon Grove Church, um, started in the basement. Um, don't have we, we don't have time, I don't have the time to really get deep into some of the other churches. To, to be honest with you, I think the early churches in um, Greensboro probably deserves a whole um, program by itself. I know folks have done it, but in terms of looking at the buildings and uh, things like that, I think that is something that uh, I would love to see a larger um, program done and a lot more time spent. But I do want to give um, give a shout out, I guess, to you know Providence Baptist, which was created in eighteen sixty six. Saint James Presbyterian, uh, eighteen sixty seven. Uh, Saint Matthew's United and Methodist, eighteen sixty six. Bethel A.M.E. eighteen sixty nine. Uh, New Light Baptist, eighteen ninety one. Uh, Trinity A.M.E. eighteen ninety six and Mount Zion, 1891. So it, it was just so important to have the black church. I think in a lot of ways, the black church was the one that, that helped to connect the education piece and the enterprise and the business piece, right? Um, and also, I heard it said that the creation and the growth of the black church, it also provided a place for us to have a level of dignity. When you consider these were men and women who went out, they did their jobs in some cases in very subservient situations, but in their church, they were deacons, they were deaconess, they were pastors, um, they were leaders in their church, which also made them leaders of the community. And so the um, black church was so crucial during this time and to make sure that there was some level of comfort that the community could have uh, for example, the um, the terracotta they they had their own church, and there this this picture is um, a, a group in front of their church, and so and so the black church was really crucial to uh, to us, especially after after Reconstruction. This is the Dean Dick Farm. And thank you, Benjamin, for sharing this with me. Um, this is the Dean Dick Farm. And, you know, I, I thought it was important to show this because not only were we involved in business and education and religious activities, but this particular farm, which was an Eastern or is an Eastern Guilford, um, you know, Dick Dean and his wife, Bertha, they, they were one of 664 African-American farmers in 1920, compared to what we have today in 2021. Uh, I will tell you that there is a resurgence in terms of black farmers, um, black farmer markets, and things of that nature. And so I think um, he would be, um, Dean Dick would be very proud to know that that is, that is uh, happening. Um, he, he raised tobacco and wheat and rye and peas and potatoes. Um, they had a beautiful log house and they raised 12 children there. They also were, um, they were also members of the nearby Wadsworth Congregational Church. So these, these churches, these um, uh, 
these so these churches, these schools, these neighborhoods, they laid the foundation for a strong, courageous, and resilient Black community in Guilford County. And they were incubators for future leaders like David Richmond, who grew up in East White Oak. Ezel Blair, now known as Jabril Kazan, who grew up in Warnersville. And other folks like uh, Nettie Code, who eventually became a um, civic leader here as well. Um, a quick story, when I met Mama Nettie and I'm doing this work in terms of getting my students to be involved in service in the community. And she was very clear about before you can really help us, you have to know our history. You have to know how we came to be. Who are the leaders in the communities? Who are they led by? Who are they mentored by? Um, which I thought was very important. And I appreciated her sharing that with us. Um, I think it's important for us as we look at reconstruction. I think a lot of people, when we go through school, we don't learn a lot about this era. And so we don't understand how crucial and how important this time was for the African-American community. It was, it acted as a jump start for us to be citizens, but at the same time, it was a, it was a push that ended way too soon. And I think most historians will agree with that. Um, it ended too soon because when you consider it was very hard, very difficult to withstand the kickback that happened in the name of Jim Crow or in the guise of Jim Crow. That being said, all these churches that I mentioned, all these institutions that, that I mentioned are still here. And so um, I think that's kind of the main part that I wanted to share. Um, I think the unfortunate commonality with a lot of the buildings and some of the neighborhoods that we talked about today was the fact that they were deconstructed for the sake of progress. And so I hope that uh, as as we look at some of the uh, the buildings and some of the communities that are still here, that we can um, we we can work to maintain them, um, lift up their history, uh, especially for the young people. I think it's really important for them to know that there was a vibrant community or vibrant communities, whether it was in Greensboro or high point in the cities, or whether it was out in the country, out on those farms. You know, 600 and some farmers. That's pretty incredible to me. So um, I think that's all I have. Well, James, that is, that's an amazing history. It's inspirational. Um, it's a testimony to the resilience of our uh, African-American community in Guilford. Um, and this is, the, this is the early history for us. This is, right. uh, as you stated, it's, a, it's an era that ended with Jim Crow, uh, but it's an era that was reinvented with the Civil Rights era, um, arguably right here in Greensboro in 1960. Um, it was reinvented again. And as you rattled off the names of the churches in our in our county, I was just thinking of others. Turner's Chapel near where I live, near yes. um, mm -hmm. Jamestown, uh, St. James and Oak Ridge. I've worked uh, with yeah. them with with various grants. Um, Bethel, St. John, Poplar Grove. Uh, mm -hmm. You showed Wadsworth Congregational. These communities, they still exist today. In 2021, yes. these communities still exist today. And that's a point of pride. And we, uh, I think that uh, I was challenging myself in ways that how can we inventory these places and how can we uh, 
raise them in our community. Uh, they're they're a, a point of pride for Guilford County. And uh, so I challenge us as a community to learn more, um, yes. to celebrate these places, uh, touchstones to our past. They're incredibly important. Um, and uh, challenge us in ways to better understand. It, as you said, it's a period that's been forgotten, um, but it's a very important, critical, pivotal time for Guilford County. And I, I'm so grateful that you're, uh, that you're here to share this, uh, this, this chapter of Guilford County with us. Yeah, uh, and I, once again, you know, in, in this very short period of time, it's hard to get too deep but I, but, but I hope this will spark um, folks to, to dig deeper. There's a lot of information, even on your, your website and blog, and there's been a lot of um, really good scholarship on the Black community. I know my um, mentor, Dr. Adrian Israel at Guilford College, she's currently looking at the history of the free Black communities in Guilford County. Um, as I mentioned, over 600, mm -hmm. which is a pretty large number, I think, uh, especially you're talking 1840. And so I'm really looking forward to seeing what she gets out of that. I think it's hard for us to find the actual spots because I think there's an airport over it now. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but, but I do think it's important for people to know whether it's 40 or West Market or any of these places where you just see, you know, stores and asphalt. But I think it's important for us to know what was there. I think it's important for us as, as a community. It's important for us to lift up that legacy of the story of African-Americans here in this town so that we don't I don't want people to come off when they think of our history, especially pre-civil rights, as this total time of oppression, because that's not what it was. Um, there was there was a lot of uplift. There was a lot of progress. Uh, a very incredible story if you consider uh, people that went from being enslaved to being leaders in their communities. And uh, I think in Guilford County, uh, we have one of the one of the better examples of that. Well, we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, we've, yes. we've got a lot of research to do, and we've got a lot of learning and listening to do. Um, so again, thank you so much for taking the time to help us celebrate Guilford County history. Uh, this is a very important chapter. Um, next month in uh, November, uh, we will learn more about women in architecture and the various ways that uh, women were involved in commissioning buildings, um, designing buildings, and, and, and impacting the architecture in Guilford County. So, um, uh, so I hope that our viewers will watch us then. And thank you again for being here and uh, stay safe. All right, thank you.